When the world learned about Jeffrey Epstein, a collective shock went around the world. How could such a man get away with years and years of sexually abusing girls and even trafficking them to his closest and richest friends? For a very long time, he was protected by his money, influence, and his connections. Until he wasn't. Although I was shocked as well, a lot of women on the internet exchanged stories about a different but related topic. The age at which they were first sexualized by men and by the rest of their communities. One would think that only someone like Jeffrey Epstein or other known and convicted pedophiles like R. Kelly were and are capable of going so far as to sexually assault and or rape a minor. But ask any woman out there about when she was first sexualized and you will realize pretty quickly that the only difference between your childhood and the one who fell victim to pedophiles was that you grew up with people who protected you enough despite being sexualized at an early age. What do I mean when I say being sexualized? It can mean something from very innocuous like being called a heartbreaker or being told that the boys will be lining up to date you to grown men on the streets catcalling you when you are merely 12 to children on TikTok being followed by grown men or children's content being saved and shared between adult men. My first memory of being sexualized was before I became a teenager when a male stranger commented on my shapely hips saying that if only I were skinnier I could for sure win in a beauty pageant. I was walking in our neighborhood in the Philippines with other girls my age when this happened. After feeling stunned by the comment, we made sure to power walk back to our individual homes and stay indoors for the rest of the afternoon. I remember that after that comment, I resorted to wearing very baggy clothes for a very long time until I felt safe again wearing form-fitting dresses or shirts. That memory is still vivid to this very day 20 plus years later. Children are vulnerable by default, and when the adults in their lives cannot protect them from other predatorial adults, or when the system is designed to protect predators and not victims, that is when we end up with harrowing stories like those from the Epstein case and the one in today's episode. This is the case of Romeo G. Halushos Sr., Mabuhay Lagim fam, my name is Christine Abrigana and you are listening to Lagim, a Filipino true crime podcast. Every other Friday, I publish Filipino crime stories from both the Philippines and the diaspora. If you want to be kept updated, please follow me on all my socials and on the podcast platform you're listening to me on. Links for my social media accounts and for my Spotify and Apple Podcasts pages are in the show notes. A special trigger warning is needed for today's episode because there will be extensive and graphic mention of multiple instances of child sexual abuse. It is a bit tough, so if this is something that triggers you, please feel free to not listen to this episode or to proceed with caution. Above all, please take care of yourselves whilst listening. Eleven-year-old Maria Roseline Delantar saw no other way but to run away from home on the 16th of August, 1996. She had help from a lodger who lived with her family. The lodger, Yami Estreta, brought the scared little girl to the Pasay City Police Station, where it became clear pretty quickly that Roseline's case was going to be a major one. The frail girl gave a statement that implicated a major politician who was and is still a part of a big political dynasty from down south. 
Rosalind had accused then Zamboanga del Norte Congressman Romeo G. Halosho Sr. of multiple instances of rape and acts of lasciviousness. Things moved quickly after that. The Department of Social Welfare and Development was contacted to take over Rosalind's care, whilst the National Bureau of Investigation initiated a major investigation that ended in a filing of criminal charges against Halos Hoss. What truly happened to Rosalind would not become clear until months later when bits and pieces of the NBI's investigation were shared to the public. I can still vividly remember the breaking news segments on TV Patrol and the many pictures and videos of Halos Hoss vehemently denying any accusations of a criminal nature. When the trial started in 1997, that was when the public learned how serious the matter was and how much young Rosalind had to go through in the hands of Congressman Halus Hoss. Rosaline was born on the 11th of May 1985 at the Dr. Jose Fabelia Memorial Hospital in Santa Cruz, Manila, a hospital that has existed since 1920. Rosaline's mom is Librada Telin, but her biological father was never in the picture. Instead, she was raised by her foster father, Simplicio Delantar, whose last name Rosaline assumed. Rosalind's mother eventually also disappeared from Rosalind's life, which left her in the care of Simplicio. Apart from the lodger I mentioned at the beginning, Rosalind was not believed to have grown up with other siblings, although she would later admit that she knew at least one brother named Shandro. Simplicio and Rosalind lived in Pasay, and court records implied that they lived a rather poor existence that may have contributed to Rosalind's fate some 11 years after her birth. Simplicio de Lantar was 56 years old at that time and was known to sell longanisa and tocino in the neighborhood as his main income source. To the non-Filipinos out there, longanisa is a type of Filipino sausage, whilst tocino is a sweet and salty pork jerky with sauce. Now, of course, Simplicio also accepted lodgers into his small home, but that business may not have always been the most reliable source of income, so he needed and wanted more money to come in. His gaze, unfortunately, fell upon young Rosalind, who was only five years old when Simplicio first exposed her to his own sexually illicit activities. It is not clear from court documents whether this meant that Rosalind was forced to watch sexual intercourse between Simplicio and another person, but what we do know is that Rosalind was dragged along late night runs by Simplicio himself, who at some point also started working as a pimp. From a very young age, Rosalind was introduced to the world of sex workers. Simplicio took her with him whenever he escorted a sex worker to their next client. Before I continue, I have to clarify a few things here. I hope we can all agree that the word prostitute has served its purpose and should never be used again. Sex workers the world over have requested and asked us over and over again to use the term sex workers because A, sex work is work and B, the term is empowering. However, I think we also need to distinguish the people who are not willingly doing sex work, those who are pimped out, exploited, and forced into that line of specific work. In the court documents I have used to produce this episode, the terms prostitute and sex workers are used interchangeably to describe a minor who has been forced into that line of work. I personally call such individuals trafficked children, so I will stick with that term in this episode. So, as already indicated, Rosalind was eventually trafficked and forced into doing what sex workers do at the very young age of nine. Not much is known about what was done to Rosalind by her first client, who happened to be a Saudi national, but what we do know from court documents is that Simplicio brokered the deal and left the young girl all alone with the adult man at least for one night. 
it can be safely assumed that this likely happened many times, and by the time Rosalind reached the age of 11, when she first met Halus Hos, she would have seen and experienced horrific abuse already. According to Roslyn, she was first introduced to Halus Hoss in February 1996 at his office near Robinson's Galleria in Quezon City. On the surface and as far as Rosalind was initially concerned, she was meeting some people who could help her get into show business. Rosalind and Simplicio were introduced to Halus Hoss by a supposed talent manager named Eduardo Suarez. In that meeting, Halus Hoss asked about Rosalind's age. Simplicio answered that she was 10 but would be turning 11 in May that same year. Halus Hoss then turned to Rosalind and asked her if she could sing. Before she could answer, Simplicio demanded that she sang something on the spot, so she did. Halus Hoss then asked if she had nice legs. Without waiting for an answer, he lifted her skirt and looked at her thighs. He then asked if she was menstruating already. Simplicio answered yes. The questions were getting more and more personal and intrusive, obviously. And then Halos Hoss asked if Rosalind had breasts already. Nobody answered, but Halos Hoss audaciously cupped the left side of Rosalind's chest and then let go. After this awful inspection of Rosalind, Halus Hoss then announced that he would help Rosalind get into showbiz, that he would help her become an actress, and that he was a producer for a noontime show called Itbulaga in a TV series named Valiente. The grown man in the room then discussed contracts for Rosalind's future movie career. Halus Hoss then said that he would also adopt the young girl who would have to live with him in his condo unit in Ritz Towers in Makati. At the end of this discussion, Halus Hoss handed Rosalind 2,000 pesos and the young girl and her foster father went home. In retrospect, of course, we can be confident in saying that what took place at that office had nothing to do with showbiz or any entertainment contract. Simplicio had simply managed to pimp out his own foster daughter to Halus Hoss and most probably stated his terms and conditions for how Rosalind would be exploited and abused. However, I did come across some interesting forums where someone pointed out that Halus Hoss met up with Simplicio and Rosalind at least two more times between February and June of that same year, where the discussion was purely about show business. Court documents do confirm that there were at least two more meetings after that initial meeting in Halus Hoss's office. According to court documents as well, in one meeting, Simplicio had apparently discussed that with the extra money from Halus Hoss or from Rosalind's upcoming acting career, he would like to finance Rosalind's studies. In another meeting, a lawyer was present who supposedly prepared the contract between Simplicio and Halus Hoss. After each meeting, Halus Hoss handed Rosalind some money, which Simplicio, of course, pocketed. I would argue that those meetings were still about trafficking Rosalind to Halus Hoss. No one could corroborate whether that lawyer in the second meeting was really a lawyer. Furthermore, I have not found any sources that contained even a section of this supposed entertainment contract, and I highly doubt Halus Hoss was in any way connected or involved with Itbulaga or Valiente. Nevertheless, with that second meeting, Rosalind's fate was sealed and what followed were two agonizing and horrible months of unimaginable abuse. According to Rosalind, after the three initial meetings with Halus Hoss, it would not be until the 14th of June 1996 at around 8.30 in the evening that she saw Halus Hoss again. This meeting took place at the former congressman's condo unit at the Ritz Towers in Makati. After the initial greetings, Simplicio told Rosalind to go inside the condo's bedroom, whilst the two adult men stayed outside and talked for a few moments. 
After this, Halushost entered the bedroom and found Rosalind watching something on TV. Without missing a beat, Halushost walked over to the young girl and kissed her on the lips. He again left the room. Simplicio then entered the bedroom. Rosalind immediately told him what Halushost did, to which Simplicio simply said, Halik lang naman. It was just a kiss. And then Simplicio was gone, leaving Rosalind all alone with Halushos. The young girl was still in the bedroom, unsure of what awaited her. A few minutes after she realized Simplicio had already left, Halushos came into the bedroom only dressed in a long white shirt with the printed word Dakak on it. He was holding another white shirt in one of his hands and told Rosalind that he wanted to change her clothes. Rosalind refused and told Halushos that she can change her clothes herself. Halushos did not like this. He looked at her and said, Daddy mo naman ako. I'm your daddy anyway and forced Rosalind out of her clothes by removing her blouse and shirt himself. He then removed her underwear. Rosalind protested. Halushos gave the same statement as before about being her daddy. Rosalind was now afraid and exposed in front of Halushos, who then proceeded to put the white shirt on her. Both of them, according to court documents, then spent some time watching TV. After a while, Halushos turned off the TV as well as the bedside lamp and turned to Rosalind to kiss her again. But it did not stop there. The court documents are very graphic in their description of the sexual assault that took place afterwards. So I will describe it here once because they will recur all throughout the episode. Once I have described these truly horrific acts, I will go back to calling them sexual assault. If there is anything that stands out and needs to be specifically described so that the story will be better understood, then I will give a description. But apart from that, I'd rather avoid being capricious with these details. Before falling asleep, Halushos fondled Rosalind's breasts and inserted his fingers into her genitals. On this evening, the court documents are clear that no intercourse or penile penetration took place, but the sexual assault was just as bad. During this assault on Rosalind, she asked him to stop as she was in pain. Halushos stopped, kissed her, touched her breasts again, and told her to go to sleep. The morning after this horrible experience, Rosalind was woken up by Halushos kissing her yet again. He then took her to the bathroom where Halushos insisted on giving her a bath. Again, Rosalind was sexually assaulted. Halushos then showered, after which he ate breakfast, whilst Rosalind stayed in the bedroom watching TV. She had hoped to go home soon, but Halushos entered the bedroom yet again, and this time the sexual assault went further as he performed oral sex on her. Still shaken up by what just happened, Rosalind was then handed 10,000 pesos. Halushos, who had a domestic helper that day, told said helper to take Rosalind shopping. Rosalind went with her and came back to Ritz Towers later, only to find that Simplicio had finally turned up to pick her up. On their way home, an upset Rosalind told Simplicio what Halushos had done to her and pleaded with him to never bring her back to Ritz Towers. But those pleas fell on deaf ears. Simplicio dismissed the young girl and told her that everything was all right as long as Halushos did not have sexual intercourse with her. Rosalind's ordeal had just started. That same day, the 15th of June, Simplicio took her back to Ritz Towers. What happened that night was like a replay of the night before, but this time, Halushos attempted to rape Rosalind. The next day, Rosalind was sexually assaulted yet again and even forced to touch Halushos's genitals. Every time these sessions were over, Halushos would either hand Rosalind or Simplicio varying amounts of money. On that specific day, it was 5,000 pesos. On their way home, Simplicio told Rosalind that if the congressman tried to have sexual intercourse with her, she must refuse. 
On the surface, this might sound like Simplicio being protective of Rosalind or aspects of her being at the very least. But no, this warning was all about the money. What was agreed between the men did not include sexual intercourse with Rosalind. If that had been the case, Simplicio definitely would have wanted more money. Sexual abuse of very young children, even only for once, have devastating consequences that endure throughout the child's life and well into adulthood. Such abuse can affect the psychological and physical well-being of the individual, as well as their family and intimate relationships, faith, education, and career. Child sexual abuse survivors and victims can also be up to four times more likely to become victims of sexual, physical, or emotional abuse again in their adult life. Often we hear about how victims and survivors of child sexual abuse develop a plethora of mental health issues such as depression or anxiety that translate into issues such as substance abuse, self-harm, lack of trust in authority, attempted suicide, and suicide. Panic attacks, low self-confidence, low mood, eating disorders, and obsessive behaviors could also manifest early or later in life. Rosalind, through the predatorial adult men in her life, was put on a fast track to those debilitating issues the moment she was exposed to sex work and trafficking. We do not know the extent of what was done to Rosalind before 1996, but the events of 1996 alone with former Congressman Halus Hoss were guaranteed to have shifted something within Rosalind that would forever change her life's trajectory. It was clear to Rosalind that whatever it was that was agreed with Halus Hoss would not end soon. She knew that she would be heading to Ritz Towers over and over again, at least for the time being. By the 18th of June, Rosalind found herself in the presence of her abuser yet again. Halus Hoss followed the same ritual as the other couple of nights, and like once before, he tried to rape Rosalind again. And this time, he succeeded. Rosalind writhed in pain. Halusos stopped and the night came to an end. Afterwards, Rosalind was not brought to the Ritz Towers for almost three days. And I guess you can assume that she was hoping her ordeal was over. Alas, on the 21st of June at about 9 in the evening, Simplicio dragged Rosalind back to Ritz Towers yet again where she was abused and assaulted that very night and the morning after. Rosalind was exhausted and traumatized, but she still held hope that every time she went home, that would be the last time she had to see Halus Hoss. This time, the break from Halus Hoss lasted a week long. When Rosalind was taken back to Ritz Towers, Halus Hoss had some new ideas. This time, he took photos of Rosalind, who probably thought that if that was all that Halus Hoss wanted to do that night, then she may count herself lucky. But alas, the sexual assault started not long after, and Rosalind had to endure yet another night with her abuser. The visits to Ritz Towers became slightly infrequent in July of 1996. Rosalind was taken to Ritz Towers on the 2nd of July and then again on the 20th when Halus Hoss raped her yet again. The next day, Halus Hoss assaulted Rosalind, as he always did, and handed her money. It would not be until the 15th of August that Rosalind was yet again dragged to Ritz Towers. This time, Simplicio and Rosalind arrived just when Halus Hoss was leaving. He told them to come back later, but the two never did. That same evening, something must have snapped inside Rosalind because she had made up her mind. She was going to run away with the help of a lodger, and she was going to report Simplicio to the police authorities. Yes, Rosalind's initial report after she had run away was not about Halus Hoss at all. It was about Simplicio pimping her out. 
only in the course of the police and NBI's investigation into Simplicio did they finally realize that they could never just investigate the foster father without investigating the former congressman as well. Halusos did not know that things were in motion and very much heading into his direction. Romeo G. Halusho Sr. was in Bagak Bataan when the warrant for his arrest was issued and executed in January 1997. From that moment on, he was detained at the Makati City Jail until his trial in December 1997. The Makati Regional Trial Court found Halushos guilty of two counts of statutory rape and six counts of acts of lasciviousness. Naturally, the convicted congressman brought his case before the Supreme Court and this was when things got rather interesting and disturbing. The Supreme Court, who handed down its decision on the 16th of November 2001, went through every pertinent evidence used during the trial and through every action taken by the trial court in Makati. We learned, for example, that Rosalind was examined by a PNP medical officer at Camp Krame a week after she made the report to the Pasay City Police. Dr. Emmanuel Aranas testified in the trial, which was reiterated in the Supreme Court appeal as well, that Rosalind's genitals exhibited lacerations that were in varying stages of healing. Externally, it did not seem to the medical officer that there was any physical violence involved in Rosalind's assault. Oddly enough, though, the good doctor declared Rosalind as a non-virgin. Now, I realize that this was 1996-1997 and medicine and human sensibilities have evolved a bit since then. Modern medicine concedes that an examination of female reproductive organs like a pelvic exam or a vaginal exam cannot reveal with absolute certainty that a person is a virgin or has been sexually active. A gynecologist can't tell if you are a virgin by doing a physical exam because of the variation in different hymens and the absence of a hymen isn't an indicator of sexual activity. To quote MedicineNet.com, every person is unique. Many people believe in the concept of virginity and hold it sacred. Though being a virgin or being a responsible sexually active person is a personal choice, an intact hymen has been used as proof of virginity in the past. The truth is that the hymen is a flexible piece of mucosal tissue that may be thick, thin, or even absent in some women. In some women, using a tampon, vigorous cycling, exercises, and masturbatory activities may cause the hymen to rupture. End of quote. I'm not exactly sure why it was important for the medical officer to include any information about Rosalind's virginity or non-virginity, but what I definitely know at this point is that Rosalind's story, if not believed by the police a week ago, seemed more and more plausible at this point in time. Now, during the trial, Halushos denied everything, obviously. His lawyers tried very hard to inject reasonable doubt by first arguing that Rosalind had, in fact, never met Halushos. Instead, she had met his brother, Dominador Halushos, at least three times, who was a dead ringer for his older brother. It is true that Dominador had met Rosalind at Ritz Towers, but that was it. Nothing untoward happened. Rosalind never implicated anyone else but her foster father and Halushos Sr. Former Congressman Halushos did what many in his position had done before, blame some sort of major conspiracy to defame him and blackmail him. In his case, Halushos blamed political rivals like former Congressman Artemio Adaza and other people who were only after some money. 
When that spiel didn't work, Halushos also offered alibis as to his locations for each of the days and nights that Roslyn accused him of sexually assaulting and raping her. His alibis were similar to each other in that he was always either back in Zamwanga or elsewhere and never at Ritz Towers. He provided at least one plane ticket for at least one of these alibis and evidence that he attended a conference for a another date. The trial court considered all this and still found Halusos guilty of two counts of rape and as I said six counts of acts of lasciviousness. For the rape convictions Halusos was sentenced to life imprisonment to be spent at the new Belibid prison. For the other convictions Halusos was sentenced to an indeterminate prison term of at least eight years and a maximum of 15 years. He was also ordered to indemnify or pay Roslyn money for moral damages. Halusos was not found guilty in six further counts of acts of lasciviousness because the court was not convinced that the prosecution proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt. I think because of this partial acquittal, Halusos felt emboldened to further appeal his case. After all, given the sentence handed down by the trial court, Halusos could look to the rest of his life being spent behind bars. So off to the Supreme Court he went. In order to be heard by the Supreme Court, an appellant needs to contend that the trial court had decided wrongly or acted against someone's constitutional rights or perhaps failed to follow court rules and legislation or case law itself. In the case of Halushos, he raised five main points that essentially accused the trial court of doing everything wrong. He contended that there were too many inconsistencies in Rosalind's statements to the police and testimony to the court, that the statements given by Rosalind were conflicting, that she did not even identify him properly, that she was not even younger than 12 years old, and that actually rape never Ever took place. The Supreme Court addressed the contentions about Roslyn's statements, knowing that, sadly, in rape cases, a victim's credibility can become very much the thing that decides a case. In a patriarchal society, unfortunately, if a victim in a rape case is deemed anything but truthful, pure, and even virginal, she almost always does not stand a chance at justice. It was therefore important for Halushos to cast doubt on Rosalind, saying that if one part of her statement was false or inconsistent, then the totality of the evidence she had provided was false as well. A legal principle known as falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus, in English, false in part, false in everything, is what the defense lawyers raised on behalf of Halushos. But the Supreme Court was not having any of it. The court reasoned that this legal principle is not absolute. I have also learned about this legal principle in law school and even then it was considered obsolete. According to the Supreme Court, if some parts of Rosalind's testimony or statements were untrue or inconsistent, nothing prevents the trial court from accepting the rest of her evidence as true. The Supreme Court went a step further and stated that their own analysis showed that Rosalind was in fact very credible as a witness. They disagreed with Halushos, who stated over and over again that Rosalind was being inconsistent. According to the Supreme Court, Rosalind gave consistent details as to her rape and sexual assault. She gave consistent details about who did it, about the times and dates, and she was also very firm and resolute in describing her whole ordeal. She may not have had the best vocabulary because she was, after all, merely 11 at the time of her rape and 12 at the time of the trial, but she described consistently what Halushos did to her. In the midst of all these attempts to discredit Rosalind, there was also something truly bizarre happening with the courts. So much time was spent by the courts and parties involved in debating the term rape. 
There are pages and pages in the Supreme Court document of this semantical debate as to what consisted rape and whether what happened to Roslyn was in fact rape. I think the source of the problem is how the term is defined in Philippine criminal law. Bear with me here whilst I indulge my geeky legal side. In Article 266A of the Revised Penal Code, rape is defined as follows. Quote, rape is committed by a man who has carnal knowledge of a woman under any of the following circumstances, through force, threat, and intimidation, or when the offended party is deprived of reason or otherwise unconscious, or by means of fraudulent machination or grave abuse of authority, and when the offended party is under 12 years of age or is demented, even though none of the circumstances mentioned above be present. Rape is also committed by any person who, under any of the circumstances mentioned in paragraph 1 hereof, shall commit an act of sexual assault by inserting his penis into another person's mouth or anal orifice or any instrument or object into the genital or anal orifice of another person. End of quote. Right off the bat, there are two problems staring us right in our faces. The definition of rape is predicated on the belief that only men can rape. Secondly, this definition can become very susceptible to creative interpretations because it lacks the most important component when talking about rape cases, consent. This definition in the penal code is not predicated on consent or lack thereof. Now, in Roslyn's case, or in any case involving a minor, consent does not become an issue, even if it is an element of the definition of rape under Philippine criminal law, because the law itself provides that even if all the other components needed to prove rape are absent, as long as the victim is under 12 years old, it is always going to be statutory rape. Now, for good measure, the legal definition of rape in England and Wales, as I've learned it, is when a person intentionally penetrates another's vagina, anus, or mouth with a penis without the other person's consent. This is a separate offense from what is called assault by penetration, which is when a person penetrates another person's vagina or anus with any part of the body other than a penis or by using an object without the person's consent. The definition is not perfect at all and also needs a rehaul but having consent at the center of it makes a huge difference in the reporting and prosecuting of the cases. A legislation from 2003 made victims of rape in the eyes of the law essentially gender neutral as well signaling to the public that anyone anyone can become a rape victim. Now that you've indulged me with my geeky legal tour there, let us go back to Roslyn. The main contention made by Halus Hoss was that even if the court agreed that Roslyn was consistent in her testimony, that her minor mistakes were negligible, that she was in fact under 12 years old at the time of the crimes against her, what happened to her was not rape. What I found in the Supreme Court decision were excerpts of Rosalyn giving testimony and being cross-examined quite extensively about what happened to her. Reading it broke my heart because studies have shown time and time again that victims who are put on the stand to testify are re-traumatized to some degree or another. It is one thing giving your main testimony, but to be cross-examined by a hostile defense lawyer is something else. In the UK, for example, adult rape victims have some degree of protection and children are given even more protection to the point that their main testimony can be given in a recorded video. With regards to cross-examination, in the UK, children can also be cross-examined, but it has to be in a safe environment and has to be pre-recorded as well. This is all to avoid further re-traumatization. A lot of such cases are also declared closed to the public. 
Rosalind had none of that protection. She was put on the stand to give her testimony and over and over again, she was asked to go into every minute detail of her rape because this was the biggest issue being appealed. I will read to you this one exchange between Rosalind and the prosecutor, bearing in mind that similar exchanges took place over and over again, not only with the prosecutor, but also the defense lawyers. Please note that the language used during trials is English. Rosalind, during the trial of Halus Hoss, needed to be assisted by a translator, so her answers here are purposefully Taglish but her real answers during the trial were purely Tagalog. I am not sure why the Tagalog parts were not translated into English for the purpose of publishing this court document by the Supreme Court, but this is what is recorded and in the public domain. The language in this exchange is upsetting, so please be warned. You said that when Congressman Halushos inserted his finger into your vagina, your back was rested on a pillow and your legs were spread wide apart. What else did he do? He lifted his shirt and held his penis and again, idinikit-dikit niya ang ari niya sa ari ko. And after doing that, what else did he do? After that, itinutok niya po yung ari niya at idiniindiin niya ang ari niya sa ari ko. The prosecution argued here that this was rape because case law clearly suggested at that time that, quote, the mere touching of the external genitalia by the penis capable of consummating the sexual act is sufficient to constitute carnal knowledge, end of quote. The defense's whole point was to argue that because Rosalind described Halus Hoss's actions as idinikit-dikit or itinutok or idiniindiin in English to touch, to point, to press his penis against her genitalia, all this did not constitute rape. They went as far to say that Rosalind had in fact not even seen the congressman's penis. The Supreme Court disagreed with the defense and went on a very long explanation tour of the female anatomy that I will not repeat here. I have linked the Supreme Court document in the sources list on my blog so you can choose to read it but again be warned it is an awful thing to read. Again, Rosalind was asked about all the lewd details of her own rape and sexual assault, and all I could think of whilst reading it was why had the DSWD or the Department of Social Welfare and Development not done anything or realized that this was doing so much damage to this young girl. Furthermore, more than once did the Supreme Court describe Rosalind as a sex worker, and I know that I've already said something about this earlier, but it is categorically wrong to be calling trafficked children sex workers. It is not only unconscionable but also inaccurate if you really wanted to nitpick. For starters, Simplicio never gave any of the money handed over by Halus Hoss to Rosalind, so that alone invalidates the sex worker title. Having said all that, the Supreme Court affirmed the trial court's decision almost 100% and Halus Hoss was remanded back to New Belibid Prison. In case you were wondering about Simplicio, he had been in prison for the duration of all the court drama with Halus Hoss. His trial was less in the public eye and as far as the few sources I read are concerned, he had been incarcerated since the 2nd of August 1997. As for Halus Hoss, though, the story was far from over. Halus Hoss, despite being in prison, managed to somehow run and win government elections in 1998 and 2001. He asked the Supreme Court to allow him to properly serve as a member of the House of Representatives, going as far as saying that he should be allowed to attend plenary sessions, but the Supreme Court denied his appeal. 
Halosos would later claim that he managed to serve his term as a politician from prison, although I doubt the effectiveness of such a setup. When Halusos' sentence was finalized in the wake of the 2001 Supreme Court decision, Halusos was eventually dropped from the list of House of Representatives members, and he could not longer further work as a congressman for his constituency. By 2005, the Delantar Halusos case was brought up again in the public consciousness when the Supreme Court heard an odd case that centered again around Rosalind's birth and birth certificate. The case did not involve Halusos, but instead involved Rosalind's birth mother, who was essentially arguing that Rosalind's birth date and all the circumstances around it were falsified. Whilst this case was not successful and Rosalind's birth certificate remains recognized as valid, it did make me feel like maybe this was an attempt by Halus Hoss to worm his way back to a possible appeal yet again by using Rosalind's birth mother. But this is only a speculation, of course. I could not find any evidence that Halus Hoss and Rosalind's birth mother were in any way connected or were in cahoots. But the issue of Rosalind's birth had been going on since 1997, and it was only in 2005 that the Supreme Court put its foot down and rejected the petitioner's case. And that could have been that. But not even two years later, Rosalind had to endure yet another blow in her attempt to lead a normal life. In a few past episodes, I talked about a time in 2007 when former President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo pardoned convicts or commuted the sentences of many controversial convicts, including former President Joseph Estrada. Alas, Halus Hoss was also one of the convicts whose sentences were drastically shortened. The initial order for Halus Hoss's release came in 2007. For some reason, the new Belibid prison let him walk free, after which he flew to Dapitan, claiming that because of the president's initial orders, he was able to just start normal life again. But this was not accurate. The order at that time in 2007 had not yet been officially approved, and Halus Hoss was never meant to be released so soon. The release was only officially approved almost two years later in 2009. And so Halus Hoss in 2007 needed to go back to the New Belibid prison to sit his sentence some more before being released in 2009. All in all, Halus Hoss only served around 13 years in prison where he was supposed to stay for the rest of his life. There is no report online about Roslyn when all this took place, but I can only imagine the dismay, hurt, and maybe fear that she may have felt knowing that her abuser had been set free and knowing that if he wanted to, he could still hurt her, given his influence and also his money. As far as I know, nothing of the sort happened. As for Halus Hoss and his new life, he wanted to get back into the political arena, and it is not surprising. After all, despite the conviction and the failed appeal to the highest court of the land, Halus Hoss still had supporters and continued to do so today. But he had one big problem. In 2013, the Commission on Elections disqualified him from the mayoral race in Zamboanga City because of his conviction. Halus Hoss appealed this decision with the Supreme Court, but he was unsuccessful, and so his political ambitions were put on the back burner. I'm not aware of any further attempts to get this decision overturned, but when then-President Duterte got elected, Halus Hoss cozied up to his fellow Mindanawan. He was outwardly pro-Duterte, and a year after the new president was voted in, Halus Hoss made his move. He asked Duterte to grant him absolute pardon. In these types of requests, the Board of Pardons and Parole take the lead in processing applications for absolute pardons that are being submitted to the DOJ. Since the DOJ is part of the executive, it made sense that Halus Hoss tried to pull on 
well, Duterte's heartstrings. An absolute pardon would simply mean that there would be no hindrance to Halushos running for office again. I am presuming, of course, that even the Commission on Elections could not veto that move by the DOJ. Halushos desperately wanted to run in the local elections in 2019. So, what happened to this application for absolute pardon? Well, I'm not sure really. News articles about this application stopped coming up in my search by the time I hit the years 2017, 2018 and onwards. I am at the moment assuming that Duterte never pardoned Halushos, but that the application might still be valid and could be put in front of the new president. Halushos, after all, vocalized his support for current vice president Sara Duterte Carpio, and I would think that he also supports Marcos Jr. by association or by pure conviction. Either way, I do not think he will stop trying, especially now that the Halushos clan is feeling rather threatened by another political dynasty in Zamboanga. As for Rosalind, she is now 37 years old, my age really. She is a grown woman, very different from the scared girl from almost 30 years ago. No one knows where she is, what she has done with her life, or whether she's still alive. I personally hope and pray that she was able to overcome what happened to her or at least found a way to cope, that she hopefully was given a lot of support by social welfare in the years following the trial and the appeal, despite this agency having a, well, not so stellar reputation in the past and present. I am hoping she had received therapy, care, love and support from the people who assumed custody of her. I hope that she is now thriving and living her best life because we have already heard how experiences like hers make it too easy for people to go a darker path because the pain and trauma can become too big, too heavy to handle that giving up might feel like a true relief. Wherever you are, Rosalind, I wish you the very best. Lagim fam, that was another tough case to go through. I hope you found it interesting nevertheless. If you did and want to do a small part in helping children that had gone through the same experience as Rosalind, please consider checking out the charity Hope Worldwide Philippines. And also please consider donating. I have included a link to their donation site in the sources list on the blog and in the show notes below. Remember that even one peso or or one dollar helps. Thank you again for listening. If you want to support what I do, please consider joining my Patreon where you can get ad-free and early episodes. I'm hoping to add more bonus content soon, so this is the best time to sign up. Apart from that, you can always make a one-off donation through buymecoffee.com. All the links you will need to support me are in the show notes. Thank you again, Lagim Fam. Maraming salamat at mabuhay.